on adoption. And then the following week, we're going to do another One Day to Feed the World, where uh, we're just asking you to pray about taking one day's wages and donating it to Convoy of Hope that they could feed the poor and do um, emergency response to natural disasters around the world. So we just want you to know ahead of time that these things are coming. And uh, the, the desire that we have here, uh, this is Jane and uh, in the heart of myself, is we really have grabbed hold of the Father's heart of adoption. And Ephesians 1, 4 through 7 says, In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. So I just encourage you to pray about um, bringing somebody next week that maybe would have uh, an open heart to help kids that are in foster care, kids that are needing adopt, to be adopted, assisting families that are adopting. And uh, there's just many ways that we all can be a part of helping rescuing these kids of 145 million kids around the world that are orphaned today. And uh, I, I just really believe that's God's heart. So anyway, today I want to talk about an issue of you need to see things to believe it. You hear many things in life, you hear stories, and they're just too far-fetched, and you just think, I'm not going to believe that unless I really see it. Like yesterday morning at 10.30, two 50-year-old middle-aged men beat two 20-something hot staff guys that think they're really cool in doubles in tennis. And so I told them I would dance in front of you to say that John Jessup and I beat Nate and Jared again in doubles. <laughs> Nate said, if you dance like that, you can tell me anything you want. <laughs> but there's other things that we hear about in life and we just says that is just too far-fetched to believe it. I want you to watch this video of a new craze that has taken over the mountains of the United States. It's just a powerful thing. It's you strapped down to this piece of fiberglass and you're moving along a flat surface and you really feel connected to MN, Mother Nature, while you're doing that. And that's when you really feel alive. Cross country snowboarding started pretty simply. It's just when you're getting off the chairlift and you gotta scooch over to the top of the hill. And that was it. In that small stretch of flat land, our sport was born. Skiers don't like snowboarders, so therefore cross-country skiers don't like cross-country snowboarders. This is an outsider sport, and it's an outsider sport of an outsider sport, snowboarding. Plus, we do it outside. So we're rocking a triple entendre there, you know? Well, one thing about us is when we do go cross-boarding, we never step out. No way. You're in from sunup to sundown. Stepping out is sacrilege in cross-country snowboarding, man. You just don't do it. You know, we got to go into the chalet and drop a deuce or do a one -ease. We're doing it with the board strapped on our feet. If you don't switch it up and go goofy every once in a while, you're going to get scooch leg. And, that, and that's where you just build up one of your legs really big. And you'll know the guys at the chalet who've got the scooch leg, man, because they're going to be walking in circles. Another cool thing about cross-country snowboarding is you can do it in the privacy of your own backyard or even in your basement on a treadmill. We know it's never gonna be the big thing. That's the great thing about cross-country snowboarding. It's impossible for it to sell out. So there you go. You may wanna try it this winter. Let me know what you think. Speaking of things that are so incredible that you have to see it, believe it, I, I was just giving news to tonight that the uh, 
the fundraiser that was done for the backpack program in the community that Moose Radio uh, took it upon themselves to blanket the community to raise money for the backpacks. So the la latest we heard is they've raised up to now $31,000 to feed the kids on the weekends. Isn't that amazing? God's just doing amazing stuff. And uh, we had a group of vineyard pastors that were here this week from our area. And uh, I just kept telling them, you guys would not believe the things that God is doing here. It's great to brag about what all these guys are doing here. One of the things on a more serious note that you just can't believe what you hear is what happened at Fort Hood on Thursday of uh, one of our own soldiers turning the gun on their own uh, fellow soldiers and killing 13 and wounding 29 others. And, and I just felt compelled that we should pray for them, pray for the families of those that have experienced this loss and the family of the, the gunman. So let's pray. Lord, uh, there are, are many things that happen around us that we just can't believe. And uh, it just seems so surreal to think that uh, a man could uh, take a gun into a, a U.S. Army base and kill his own fellow American soldiers. And uh, God, we, we just pray for your mercy for those families that have experienced an incredible and shocking loss in their lives. So I pray that you would fill them with your grace. And we also pray for the family of the gunmen uh, that uh, in their shock, Lord, that you would reveal yourself to them, reveal your heart to them, and that you would love on every one of them. And we uh, just pray that you would make some sense out of a seemingly uh, senseless act. And Lord, as we uh, come before you today and uh, we look at Acts 3, I, I pray that you would help us to hear your word in a way that it, your Holy Spirit, that you would speak to us and speak to us in a way that we would actually follow. Speak to us in a way that brings conviction that leads to repentance. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, in the, in the spirit realm, I, I know that we hear of, of many testimonies of people experiencing things in, in the spirit realm. And uh, to many of us, we hear things and we go, you know, that's just a little too out there for me. I don't know if I really believe that. Because we haven't seen it. We haven't experienced it ourselves. But it's interesting, Andrew Murray, he wrote about how we keep God in a box. And he said, beware in your prayer, above everything, of limiting God, not only by unbelief, but by fancying that you know what he can do. And so there's this God box that we all have. Some of us have a God box that's, you know, like this big. Others have a God box that's way bigger because we've experienced more. We have more faith but the reality is, is all of us in this room are limited in our knowledge and understanding of God because he's just so much greater and beyond that. The problem is, is we try to limit God and keep him in this controlled little box that's predetermined that we're comfortable with. And the reality is, who's really being God is ourselves in that that we've created, in a sense, an idol. That we've created a God that we are in control of. And God wants to just blow that out of the water. He wants us to see him as he really is. In fact, the Jews themselves, that's what they did. They had this perspective of who God was, and they kept him in a little box. And so when God showed up right under their noses through Jesus, they didn't even see him. And I think sometimes we're the same way. But some of you have bigger noses than me. In fact, probably 99% of you do. And so God can be right there in front of us, and we don't even see him. I'm just as guilty as the next person because I have my own little Jesus box that I try to keep him in. But in the book of Acts, 
We see various accounts, even in the first two chapters, in the first part of chapter 3, we've seen various ways that God's blowing the people's boxes to smithereens. In Acts 1, Jesus is talking to the fellows. He says, get ready, guys. The Holy Spirit's coming because I'm leaving. And also, poof, he just goes up into heaven right in front of their eyes and disappears in the clouds. Have any of you seen that lately? In Acts 2, the Holy Spirit descends on them as they're praying. And all of a sudden, they hear this rushing wind come into the room, and then they see tongues of fire literally fall on everyone in the room. And then they start speaking in tongues. They're talking in different languages of different nations and people groups that they've never been trained of. They're going, holy smoke, did you see what I saw? And then Peter gets up, and he preaches a message to all of them. And it doesn't talk about this, but I think what happened is because there were people there from many nations, Peter began to talk to them, and God translated it in each of their languages. And it says over 3,000 people gave their life to Jesus. They repented and got baptized. I don't know about you, but I've never been in a church meeting like that. And then Peter walks up, and there's a man that's crippled from birth. And Peter reaches down and says, in the name of Jesus, be healed. In Acts 3, 6, it says, Then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly, the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet, and he began to walk. I don't know about you, but that's not something we see every day. But we need to look at things from a historical perspective for Israel, for the people of Israel. In the Old Testament, through oral tradition... The Hebrew people have, had, have heard story after story of the father of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac, and the miraculous things that God has done for their people. They've heard stories like, did you hear the story where God nuked Sodom and Gomorrah? Did you hear the story where God was rescuing our people and he got this guy out in the desert that's watching his father-in-law's sheep named Moses and he sends him to the Pharaoh and he gathers up the people and God splits the Red Sea so they can get away from those dirty Egyptians. And then there's this guy, a prophet by the name of Elijah and Elijah challenges the prophets of Baal and he builds an altar for each God, the God of Israel and the God of the prophets of Baal. And then he calls on the God of Israel after they doused it three times with water. It was so full of water that a moat around the altar was full of water and fire comes down and totally consumes it. And so they've heard story after story of the great things that God has done for the people of Israel. But all of a sudden, God goes, and he pushes the mute button. And they don't hear a thing for God, from God for 400 years. From Malachi to Matthew, nada, nothing. Where was God? Where did he go? They haven't heard anything from God for 400 years, and they're crying out to God, are you still there? Do you remember us? So suddenly Jesus comes on the scene. Jesus comes, and God begins to reveal himself to them again through Jesus, that Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus begins to teach in ways that they've never seen before. He's teaching with these parables that are blowing the people's minds. We've never heard teaching like this before. He begins to heal the sick, and he's casting out demons. And suddenly the people's hopes perks up. God remembered us. He's come back. But no, Jesus gets crucified. What's up with that? He comes, he says he's here, and then he gets hung on a cross? Abandoned by God. That's what they felt. 
Ever felt abandoned by God? Did you ever pray and wonder, God, where the foul ball are you? What, I, it frustrates me. God, everyone else is hearing by, from you, but I don't hear a thing. It's just like the Denver Broncos. <laughs> We're looking for the resurrected John Elway. You ever hear of Jay Cutler? Abandoned again. <laughs> but Jesus came back. He got resurrected. All of a sudden, he shows up again. He shows up. And he's revealing himself to people, and there's this stir going around. They're hearing about Jesus. Boop, he walked right through a wall and just appeared in a room. But then he goes up to heaven again. He disappears again. But now things change. As we see in Acts, what's happening here in Acts 3 is all of a sudden their God boxes begins to be stretched. Because now, a paralytic man that everybody knew was paralyzed from birth. This wasn't some actor that they hired from Hollywood. Act like a lame man so that when we touch you, you stand up and walk, okay? This is nothing like this. Everybody in the community knew because they saw this man every day begging at this gate because it was the only way that he could live. And all of a sudden, a man, Peter who was one of the apostles, the disciples of Jesus, he walks up to him and he says, you know, dude, money, silver, gold, I don't have. Look at my pockets are empty, but what I do have I give to you. Stand up and walk, man. And the man begins to walk. This is the scene of what we have here. And the people had to see it to believe it. All of a sudden, God's kingdom was showing up through these guys, the apostles. These are fishermen from Nazareth, mind you. These aren't trained theologians. And the people were astonished. In Acts 3.11, it says, While the beggar held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Men of Israel, why does this surprise you? It's the same thing that God does to us. Why does it surprise you when I do something? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power, our godliness, we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant, Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murder be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him, as you can all see. You see it? Guys, now believe it. That's what Peter was saying. It says the people came to him and they were astonished. The Greek word here is mean they were utterly astonished. We can't even put the full expression of this. It blew them away. They were flabbergasted. They couldn't believe what they were seeing. They're thinking, is it really true that this Joel 2 prophecy is really happening here? In Joel 2, 29, we, you heard about it from Acts 2, where Peter said, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below. This prophecy that they have been longing for all of a sudden was being fulfilled. But they had to see it to believe it. It created such a stir that the people came running. They were all talking about it. And Peter said, whoa, 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 guys, wait a minute. It's not me. It's in the name of Jesus, meaning it was Jesus himself, the crucified Lord that you guys killed. He's the one who healed this man. And I think in the same way, 
many of us respond to God the same way. We see weird stuff happening around us, and we go, that can't be God, because it's not in my God box. Last week, I heard amazing testimonies of Bob Clifford's message and calling up people to be healed and and hearing stories of people saying that they felt God touched them in a significant way. I haven't heard any doctor's reports yet, and I'm longing for that. But I did hear of something as simple as a woman out in Clifton that they've been going out to minister to on Sunday afternoons. She needed a job. And so the people came and prayed for her, for God to give her a job that she desperately needed. And then just the next day on Monday, she gets called, and she's given her old job back. And it's just coincidence, very possible. But is it too amazing for us to believe that God heard their prayers and gave this woman a job back? Sue King told me about a woman that they went to give food to and pray for, and uh, she looked down in this woman's hand. She said she had this unbelievably ugly, grotesque growth on her hand. And she was too poor to go to the doctor. And, and Sue said, well, can we pray for you? She said, sure. So they prayed for her. And then they came back two weeks later to see this woman again and pray for her. And she looked at her hand, and, and her hand was completely well. The growth was gone. And Sue goes, what happened to your hand? She goes, what do you mean? She says, it's not there anymore, the growth. She goes, God healed me when you guys prayed for me. We have to see it to believe it. Are we astonished? But the question is, how has God been revealing himself to you today? How has he been revealing himself to you? Sometimes he reveals himself to us in ways that we don't normally expect. Sometimes it's through a commercial you see on TV. Sometimes it's through a song you hear coming through the radio, and all of a sudden something's happening in your heart. God's doing something there. A lot of times your spouse is trying to tell you something from God, and you're saying, get away from me, devil. (laughs) Sometimes it's your mother-in-law. And you're telling your wife, we need to put that woman in a home. (laughs) But God is trying to talk to us. But it's not in the box that we think, and so we discredit it. And then we go, God, where are you? You're not talking to me. And God's saying, hello. I'm out here loud and clear. We can't put limits on God we got to hear him. In verse 17, it says, Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Christ would suffer. Repent, then, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Now, that is a very important statement that Peter is saying there. I mean, there's, there's some incredible theological principles in that one sentence that we just got to grab hold of. It says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Many people come here looking for refreshing from God, but we're not willing to repent. And he says that in that he may send the Christ who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything. You know, Jesus is coming back a second time. As he promised long ago through his holy prophets, for Moses said, the Lord your God will raise him up for you, a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Are we really listening? Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from among his people. There's this thing about not listening to Jesus. What happens is we're cut off in fellowship with the Father. 
But when we begin to listen and we hear and we repent and turn to Jesus, all of a sudden relationship is restored. So what Peter was saying here is, guys, you need to see Jesus, you need to hear his words, and then you need to respond. You need to repent. And there is a huge distinction, friends, between conviction and repentance. I want you to hear me out on this, okay? There is a big difference. I'm convicted of things every day, but I repent of very few things. It's really true. I could go on and on and on about things that we're convicted about, about what we should eat, about how we should spend their time. We were just at a marriage retreat where there was a lot of conviction of how I should treat my wife. But true repentance means I change on how I treat her. Peter said, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Christ who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. You see, when we actually repent of our sins and turn away from them and turn to Christ, that's when the kingdom comes, and that's where we truly experience true refreshment in the Spirit. That's where we begin to experience the abundant life that Jesus was talking about. That's when we begin to taste the living water, where we will never thirst again. It doesn't happen by just saying a prayer, oh, good, I'm forgiven, and then we go back and do the same things we've always done. And we wonder why, where are you, God? But when we begin to repent of our sins and begin to follow Jesus, all of a sudden God's voice becomes clearer and clearer, and we see Jesus more and more. I have an illustration of a story I heard it's about a pastor. A young man calls him in distress, and so they agree to meet at a restaurant the next morning. And so they meet the next morning, and the young man tells the pastor that he was on a business trip and that he stayed up too late at a local bar and was talking with a women colleague, and he said that the alcohol, distance from home, and easy laughter the two shared led to the obvious. They ended up in bed together. Now what? asked the man. The pastor took a deep breath. He thought of the young wife and small children whose lives could be so terribly affected by a night of indiscretion. To preserve the family, he briefly considered advising the young man to cover up the air. But then the eternal consequences of establishing such a, such a spiritual pattern convinced, convinced him that honesty was the path to follow. To make the young man think biblically about what he must do, the minister asked him a series of questions. Had he prayed to ask God's forgiveness and pardon? That's the conviction part. Had he confessed his, confessed his sin to the young woman involved and told her that the intimacy would never happen again? That's when you begin to move into repentance. Had he confessed his wrong to his wife and asked her forgiveness? That's true repentance. And if he was not yet ready to do this, had he at least arranged to have an AIDS test? For until he had been tested, he could not approach the marriage bed without endangering his wife and the child she was expecting. So the young man listened to each of the questions without expression or comment. When the pastor finished, the young man pushed his breakfast plate away from him, leaned back on his seat and said, I'm disappointed in you, Pastor. I came for grace, not for discipline. And the words cut the pastor to the heart. He did not wonder if he had said what he had said on the occasion was wrong. He wondered, rather, what he had said in the past that would lead an intelligent intelligent capable man such as this, to believe the promises of grace mean we will never have to face any consequences of wrongdoing. 
You see, the reason God wants us to move beyond conviction to repentance because there is true consequences to our sin. When we do things that are contrary to the teachings of the scriptures, the reason God puts those things there is not to control us, is not to squelch our fun, but is to liberate us. It's to help us to live a life that we can flourish and walk in the grace of God. And that's where we get things wrong. We think that once we pray for forgiveness, now we're free to go sin boldly. But the reality is, friends, that when we continue to live a life and we choose to sin willingly, there is a wake of destruction that we get sucked into, and then we wonder, God, where are you? When we're the ones that put us where we are. Sin destroys us spiritually, it destroys us emotionally, and it destroys us relationally. That's why God says don't do it, because he loves us so much. And he doesn't want us to have to face those consequences. It's the same thing that you do with your kids. The reason we discipline our kids is because we know if you keep doing that, you're going to end up having this happen to you, right? But then... They're challenged to follow Jesus in verse 24. It says, Indeed, all the prophets from Samuel on, as many as have spoken, have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, Through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you. How? By turning each of you from your wicked ways. When we turn away from sin and turn to follow Jesus, all of a sudden the blessings of God begin to be poured out on us because we're beginning to live the way God wired us to live. The question is, how are we going to turn from our wicked ways? It's easier said than done. I think the reality is, is our focus is off. We're focusing on the wrong things. Many of us, we're focused on the things that we shouldn't do. Dallas Willard, in his book, The Divine Conspiracy, he calls this sin management. This is a a fallacy in the church that people think that I just need to manage my sin and begin to sin less, and then I become more godly. And so, I'm going to quit smoking. I'm going to quit drinking. I'm going to quit chewing. And I'm going to quit kissing girls that do. (laughs) And then I'm going to be just a gooder Christian. I'm just going to do gooder things. I'm going to go to church at least two times a month. I'm going to be nice to my wife and my kids. And I'm going to start being honest on my golf scores. And I'm going to feel better about myself being a better Christian. Now, not that these things are wrong in themselves. But when we do that and we get into this kind of mentality, we wonder why we always fail. Because we just can't be gooder. And we wonder why I can't quit doing all these bad things. Why do I keep falling into that? I'm such a loser. And we beat ourselves up. Our wife beats us up. And we just go, oh, we just give up. I'm just not going to try anymore. This Christian stuff doesn't work for me. But it's still about us, isn't it? We're the ones trying to do it. We're still the ones trying to be in control. We're the ones still being God of our life. But what Jesus wants from us is quite simply to just follow him. That's the focus. The focus shouldn't be on quitting all these things, but the focus just needs to be on Jesus. 
Keep our eyes on him. And then when we keep our eyes on Jesus and we start walking and following him, all of a sudden we start realizing, you know, something's happened, something's changed in my heart because I'm starting to follow Jesus. You know, when when Jesus walked up to Peter, he's tending his nets. Jesus walks up to Peter. He doesn't give this three-point sermon of the theology of discipleship. He says to Peter, dude, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. What did Peter do? Okay. It was something in his heart. He was longing to have the Lord to follow. And it's the same thing in every one of us in this room. You have this God-instilled desire to follow God. To follow Jesus. It's the way God's wired you. And when we're not doing that, we wonder why our life is a wreck. It's because you're not living the way God's called you and created you to live. That's what faith is. Faith is choosing to follow Jesus. We don't always know where he's taking us, but we know he's faithful. And we know as long as we follow him, he's going to lead us in the path that we're supposed to go on. Where I am today, at 53 years old, I would have never guessed when I was 30 years old, I'd be right here. Look at all you pretty people. I found this other story of a guy named Shane Claiborne. He's a young Christian activist whose mission is to take Jesus and the message of the gospel seriously. I love this. Shane is one of the founding members of The Simple Way, a Christian community in Philadelphia. Their mission is to love God, to love people, and to follow Jesus. Novel idea. In his book, The Irresistible Revolution, he describes how God revealed himself through the homeless of all things. Listen to these stories. I saw one woman in a crowd as she struggled to get a meal from one of the late night food vans. When we asked her if the meals were really worth the fight, she said, oh, yes, but I don't eat them myself. I get them for another homeless lady, an elderly woman around the corner who can't fight for her own meal. I saw a street kid get 20 bucks panhandling outside a store and then immediately run inside to share it with all of his friends. I met a blind street musician who was viciously abused by some young guys who would mock her, curse her, and one night even sprayed Lysol in her eyes as a practical joke. As we held her that night, one of us said, man, there are a lot of bad folks in the world, aren't there? And she said, oh, but there are a lot of good ones too. And the bad ones make you, the good ones, seem even sweeter. We met a little seven-year-old girl who was homeless, and we asked her what she wanted to do when she grew up. She paused pensively and then replied, I want to own a grocery store. We asked her why, and she said, so I can give out food to all the hungry people. And he said, Mother Teresa used to say, in the poor we meet Jesus in his most disguising, distressing disguises. I'm going to invite the worship team up. You see, the reality is, friends, Jesus is all around. The kingdom of God is constantly moving around us. And he wants us to see him to believe him. And when we see him and we follow him and we see him in the various situations of our life and we see him moving through other people that are speaking to us, even to those in their most distressing disguises, we begin to see Jesus more. We begin to hear him. And when we repent and begin to follow him, we see him even more. We have to see Jesus 
We have to hear Jesus, and we have to follow Jesus. Isaiah 6, verse 9 says, Go and tell this people, Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. It's kind of a paradoxical statement there, isn't it? Yeah, go ahead and continue to be calloused. Go ahead and continue to not hear and see and wonder why you're not being healed. The reality is, when we hear with our ears and see with our eyes and understand with our hearts and we turn and follow Jesus, then the healing of God comes into our hearts and we experience life in the grace of the kingdom of God. It starts with us. Do we desire it? Are we willing? Are we willing to say yes to Jesus no matter where he leads us? That, my friends, is called lordship. It's what he calls us to. Are you willing to turn over the keys of your heart and allow Jesus to start being Lord of your life? And when we do that, Jesus says, dude, follow me, bro. Follow me, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Follow me, and I will lead you to life, and life abundantly. Follow me, and I will use you to change the world. Let's stand as we worship. And as we're worshiping here, the ministry team will be up front. And the challenge for all of us today is, I'm just going to throw it out there. Who's the Lord of your life? Is it yourself? Or is it Jesus? And I'm going to challenge you to make a bold statement today and just say, Lord, I'm going to choose to make you Lord of my life, maybe for the first time. Maybe I've fallen away from you, Lord, and I'm choosing to come back to put you first in my life. And come forward and have these guys pray for you. There are others here that you are feeling extremely distant from God, and you haven't heard his voice for a long time. And you're crying out to God. You say, God, I just need to hear your voice. I need to see you again so that I can follow you. Speak to me, Lord. Come forward and have these guys pray for you so that God will start revealing the things of his heart to you. And there are many here that you just need to, for the first time, say, I need to say yes to Jesus. I'm going to turn my life over to him right now. And the ministry team is here to pray for you, to help you to make that step into life of the kingdom of God. So as we worship prayerfully, ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Bless you guys.